Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Bonner. I'm a research associate at Imperial College London. And today I'm going to be talking to you about some of the fire statistics available in the UK and what they can tell us about changes in fire safety practice over time. Statistics can be a powerful tool for finding trends in complex or noisy data. If you talk to 10 of your friends about their financial worries, it might be interesting, but it's probably not going to tell you very much about UK economic growth in the last 10 years. There's too many factors going on. They could be having a bad day and overstate their case, or perhaps you're only friends with wealthy millionaires. We can dream. But if you really want to know what's going on, you need larger, more reliable sets of data. Statistics is the practice of estimating features of large groups using small samples from that group. The larger the sample, the more accurate and reliable the predictions we can make about the group as a whole. Fortunately, UK fire services have been collecting data on fire fatalities since the 1980s, and they've been adding more and more detail over time. For the rest of this lecture, we're going to be going through those statistics from 1994 to the present day to discuss how they've changed and what we can learn from them. This is a plot of fire fatalities per million people in Britain from 1994 to 2020. You can see on the y-axis we have the fire fatalities per million um, and that is across England, Wales and Scotland. As you can see the trend is a positive one. Uh, fire fatalities have steadily been going down and in fact the average decrease based on the line of best fit is a 68% decrease from 1994. This is fantastic news for fire risk. It suggests that we are the safest we've ever been in the UK and in fact we only have around six deaths per million people each year. That's very impressive. These statistics and the rest of the statistics we'll be going through today are all available publicly online and are published each year by the Department for uh, Housing, Communities and Local Government, or whatever its name is, uh, by the time this recording goes out. So this is the great news, but how do these fires break down? So in a uh, study we did looking into fires specifically in London, the report of which is available uh, online or should be available online, we found that actually the most dangerous fires that we face in this country are dwelling fires. So dwelling fires are fires anywhere in any building that people live in. These dwelling fires account for 28% of all the fires in London each year, but they account for 70% of the casualties in that time. So these are statistically the most dangerous kind of fire. This could be for a number of reasons, possibly uh, because dwellings, people are more likely be, to be asleep. Also, compared to offices or restaurants, people are more likely to have mobility issues uh, and be unable to escape in the case of a fire. This uh, plot on the left, on the y-axis, we have the total fatalities per million Londoners, as before. Uh, on the x-axis, we have the year. And these bars show the breakdown of the fatalities from dwelling fires in blue versus the fatalities in other kinds of property, such as hotels or restaurants. And you can see there the difference is, is stark. Uh, there are many more fatalities each year uh, in dwellings. Um, but the good news is, on the right, we have a plot of the dwelling fire fatalities per million people in England each year. This is the same as the plot on the previous slide, the same kind of idea. And you can see that the decrease is almost exactly the same, suggesting that although these fires are the most deadly, these have also been decreasing and they're at a historic low. So this is good news for fire risk in the UK. Now, the reason we're going to focus on dwelling fires is because more data uh, is available for these kinds of fires. and that's what we'll be restricting the rest of the analysis in this presentation to. So 
The reason for this decrease in the number of fatalities that take place in dwelling fires could be for two different reasons. Either it could be that there are fewer fires in dwellings, so that suggests that the onset of fire is less likely. This could be due to a number of initiatives. Perhaps public education has improved, so um, people are more aware of possible sources of ignition. There could just be fewer sources of ignition in people's homes. Uh, for instance, smoking is less popular than it used to be. There could be safer building materials being used, and we could have better knowledge of what materials we can build with. Or there could be more access to means of early suppression. So fires don't get to the point where the fire brigade gets involved, um, either because people have access to fire blankets, um, fire extinguishers, or perhaps even uh, sprinkler systems. So these could all be reasons for the no total number of dwelling fires decreasing. And in that case, we should see a trend in the decrease in number of dwelling fires. And indeed, if we look at that plot, uh, here we have on the y-axis the number of dwelling fires per million people in England. And we can see in this time period that number of fires has decreased at almost exactly the same rate as the number of fatalities uh, percentage-wise. So this shows that the total number of dwelling fires has been decreasing at almost exactly the same rate as the number of dwelling fire fatalities, suggesting that indeed, yes, the chance of a fire occurring is the lowest it's ever been. That is a large cause in fire risk in dwellings. Of course, the other possibility is that these fatalities could be going down also because our buildings are safer after a fire breaks out. This would suggest improvements in measures such as how easy it is to evacuate. Are there multiple evacuation routes? Is there good signage? Can the fire be detected early uh, so that people have plenty of time to evacuate before it gets too big? Is the building designed in a way that it limits the spread of fire? These things uh, are all referred to as layers of fire protection and you'll be learning more about them in the next lecture. But for the time being, it'd be interesting to know whether these sorts of measures have been improving as well. So if that were the case, we would expect that the number of fatalities per fire over this time period would also have decreased in a similar way. So if we plot that, we can actually see that if we plot on the y-axis uh, the number of fatalities per thousand dwelling fires, um, or the average number of fatalities per thousand dwelling fires against the year, this has remained approximately constant uh, over this period. Um, suggesting that although the number of fires is decreasing, and that has lowered fire risk, once a fire breaks out, the risk has remained very steady over this time period. So this suggests the things I was mentioning before, controlling the spread of fire, having safe evacuation routes or air detection. Not that buildings aren't doing that, but that they haven't had any significant improvement in those protection measures since 1994. This suggests that the measures I was talking about before, such as evacuation routes, early detection, and controlling the spread of flame, uh, not that they're failing, but just that they haven't had a significant improvement since 1994. Of course, these measures will matter different amounts in different kinds of building. Um, for instance, evacuating from a single-storey house is very different to evacuating a high-rise building, um, as long as there's enough escape uh, routes that you can move away from the fire. It should be very easy to get out of a single story house. And as long as the fire doesn't grow very quickly, that should be okay. But in a high rise building, you need uh, a much more complicated strategy. And so we expect the risk would be different over different types of dwellings. And indeed, this plot shows the probability of a fire becoming fatal. So that is once a fire bro has broken out, what is the probability there'll be at least one death based on our data set? And on the x-axis, we have different types of property. So either single occupancy housing, one to three storey flats, four to nine storey flats, or flats uh, greater than 10 storeys. And this plot shows clearly, um, and for each point, we've also got uh, error bars showing the uh, uncertainty in the estimate of that probability. And you can see that for single occupancy flats, one to three storey flats, four to nine storey flats, they all have a similar risk, a similar probability that a fire 
might become fatal and there's an overlap in their uncertainty but it's significantly higher risk for flats greater than 10 stories this uh, is understandable in the sense that the fire issue is more complex in terms of needing more complex evacuation strategies there's more people that need to escape and there's uh, a longer distance for them to go before they're safe if we delve into this in more detail we've actually got a table here of looking at these different measures I mentioned. So at the top of this table, we can see the different dwelling types uh, and the total number of fires in each of these dwelling types from the period 2009 to 2020. And you can see we've got here data on the average evacuation time. So the time it took for people to escape the fire, the average number of fires where compartmentation, that is just the rooms in the building were designed in a way that they controlled fire spread successfully and we've got the number of fires where sprinklers were present. So that's kind of these three systems that can control a fire after it's broken out. And you can see that, so for single occupancy housing, obviously it's not as important that the fire is uh, contained and controlled um, because the evacuation time is very short. They rarely have um, sprinklers. Uh, in fact, sprinklers are very rare in all the types of building. Analyzing this data set, we also found that only approximately half of fires where the building had a sprinkler did the sprinkler actually succeed in controlling the fire. So they're not a silver bullet even when they're present. But you can see they're also not very common in flats in the UK. Compartmentation, on the other hand, in flats is usually successful in 75% of cases, approximately the building tends to successfully control the spread of fire before it gets too bad. But you can see probably the main cause of why high-rise buildings are, or flats greater than 10 storeys, are more dangerous seems to be the evacuation time, which is almost double uh, that of four to nine storey flats, maybe even almost triple that of one to three storey flats. So clearly uh, it's the length of time and the number of people in the building uh, that seem to increase this risk. Of course, we've found that once a fire breaks out, the risk has remained relatively constant over time. So you wonder whether these layers of protection, these um, protection measures have changed over time as well. Uh, and if we look at these plots on the plot on the left, uh, the y-axis shows the proportion of fires where the fire spread was successfully controlled uh, by the compartmentation or by the design of the walls and floors. In red we've got for houses with single occupancy, blue is one to three storey flats, green is four to nine storey flats and black is ten plus storey flats. And you can see that this proportion of buildings has remained almost the same over time. It's remained very very similar. This suggests that compartmentation, the quality of um, the walls and floors of buildings hasn't really changed over this time period, although it is obviously quite high as well. It's around 75%, as we said. And the plot on the right shows the proportion of fires where the building had a sprinkler that was a system that was able to try and control the fire. You can see, so these proportions go from 0 to 1, 1 being 100% buildings, 0.05 uh, being 5% buildings. And you can see that in this case, again, the number of sprinklers has remained approximately constant, except in the case of 10 plus storey flats or flats above 10 storeys, where it seems to have increased uh, quite dramatically in the last, um, last few years. So perhaps sprinklers will become more popular as a safety measure in the future. And it'll be interesting to look back at this data in 10 years or so and see whether the fatalities per thousand dwelling fires has still remained steady or whether this has improved at all. Finally, um, we're looking here at fires with greater than six fatalities. So in US fire statistics, they refer to these kinds of fires as catastrophic fires. Obviously, if there's this many fatalities in a fire, it suggests something has gone very wrong. And you can see from the plot on the left here, on the y-axis, we have the number of dwelling fires. Uh, so the total number of fires that have reached that number of fatalities. So on the x-axis, that's the number of fatalities. And 
the y-axis is the frequency of fires with that number of fatalities. And you can see that fires where it, with one fatality are quite common, uh, particularly in single occupancy houses. But as we go to two fatalities, the number drops off very dramatically. Fires with three fatalities are very rare. And then fire, catastrophic fires, um, there are in fact only three in the last 12 years, two of which got a lot of media attention. That would be the Lacknell House fire, which you may remember, and the Grenfell Tower fire from 2017. Interestingly, both these fires involved the spread of fire externally, and that's what a lot of the media stories will have focused on. But two data points are not enough to make a trend. And this is actually the point about catastrophic fires, is that there's a lot of uh, different factors that go in to what went wrong in a catastrophic fire. And so it's difficult to learn anything from them using statistics, which require you know, many different examples to draw trends. So these kinds of fires are where you really need to bring in fire engineering expertise to really look into all the possible causes, see what went wrong, and see how we could prevent similar disasters in the future, or spot them before they occur. In this lecture, we've looked at UK fire statistics over the last 30 years to see what they could tell us about changes in fire risk over time. We've seen that UK fire fatalities are at a historic low and are steadily decreasing year on year. Most of these fatalities take place in dwelling fires, that is, fires in residential buildings. This is because people in these buildings are more likely to be asleep or have mobility issues than in other types of property. By investigating the total number of dwelling fires each year and also the number of fatalities per fire, we saw that the decrease in total fatalities has mainly come from the prevention of the onset of fire in the first place, either due to the use of safer building materials, fewer ignition sources, better public education, or more access to early suppression mechanisms, such as sprinklers or fire extinguishers. Once a fire has started, however, the chance of it causing harm has remained relatively constant over time. This is consistent with a lack of change in the proportion of buildings that could control the spread of fire once a fire broke out, and with the relative lack of change in the average evacuation time across buildings over this time period. Finally, we saw that the number of individual fires with more than six fatalities, what we refer to as catastrophic fires, is very low, with only three such fires over the last 12 years in London. These fires can be due to a wide range of issues and are difficult to predict using statistics alone. This is why fire engineering is so important in order to spot these kinds of disasters or the potential for these kinds of disasters before they occur. In the next lecture, you'll be looking at some of the tools fire engineers use to analyse the fire safety of a building, specifically the different layers of fire protection. Thank you for your time and attention.